I'd like to bring up uh, uh, Beatrice and uh, just you, you probably all read about her. But she's the an IT she's the IT technology leader in Houston, which is the seventh largest district in the country, and uh, speaks not only all over the country but um, I've heard she's she's spoken internationally as well. So I'm going to stop my slides, and I'm going to bring up Beatrice. Well, hi. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Good. Doing? So um, you're an hour behind us. Uh, you're you're at, at seven o'clock, um, or you know seven o five. So just maybe just kind of as a warm up, what got you into education, and what got you into education technology? Well, that's an interesting question because, uh, as you uh, know, my my degree is in the fine arts. I studied I studied painting, printmaking, and I taught painting, printmaking, and eventually I migrated to art history. For many years, uh, but my under I had two undergraduate degrees and was in education, so I was always interested. Uh, even as I was studying mm -hmm. art, I was always interested in teaching. But uh, when I was mm -hmm. at Glenn College in Texas, uh, ah. the community college really had to get online because we didn't have enough classroom space. So I put one of the first mm -hmm. online art history and art appreciation courses. Uh, and uh, when I put my courses online, I learned more about teaching and learning than I had learned in all the years of teaching experience. Really? And of hmm. course, um, in the arts, I used, you know, the Adobe software, Photoshop, and digital video editing and audio editing and all that stuff. So I started learning how to use digital through the arts, but um, putting courses online was just the most joyful experience I had as a teacher. Hmm. That's interesting. So, um, so that got you into, um, I guess, more and more into the te technology and seeing the differences between what you wanted to do and where the technology was and what was ready for the classroom, which, which brings us to today, right? That's right. <laughs> so, uh, so let me bring up your your slides, and I'll get out of your way. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the things we've put in place in Houston. Uh, our, uh, we implemented, many of you probably know, we implemented a one-to-one -one initiative. Uh, we started that four years ago. And from the beginning, our goal was, what can we do to help our teachers support all the students and all the needs of the learners? And so from the beginning of our conversations about the one-to-one -one initiative, it was, um, what can we do? What can technology do to help people learn? Uh, Mitch, can you move? I guess you have to move the slide, right? OK. Uh, so very quickly, I learned that in higher ed, in, in, uh, in K-12, one of the biggest challenges is uh, most of the districts have many different suppliers of content. And uh, our teachers really spend an enormous amount of time adding students to different platforms and troubleshooting passwords. And so one of the first problems that we wanted to solve was, can we make this effortless? Can we make the access to applications seamless for teachers or students? So our students and our teachers can just focus on teaching and learning. And the second thing, and this came straight from my boss, I report to the chief technology officer, but I, I should declare that from the beginning, this initiative included school leadership, uh, the chief academic officer, curriculum department, education technology, which is my area, and the other IT infrastructure and logistics. And the message from our chief officers was very clearly, we are servants of the school. We are here to provide a service. You know, we need to learn what can we do to help them, and we need to focus on what can we do to support the very important tasks they have in the classroom. So let's move to the next slide. So in Houston, we articulated what we thought was what we wanted to do. I think many districts are talking about this. We're all talking about learner-centered instruction, moving from the stage to the side, becoming mentors. Uh, and teaching students in the way that students learn best, listening to their needs, paying attention to the things that work for each of them, 
what I have here is a little roadmap. We thought it was really important to present teachers uh, and principals who, of course, evaluate teachers, right? Uh, with a roadmap, because we're asking teachers to teach in a way that they were never taught themselves. And so what does learner-centered instruction look like? You know, it sounded like, like really esoteric. We went with the definition of Barbara Bray and Kathleen McClaskey, which is based on the U.S. Department of Education, and we simplified it in this chart. And so we think, you know, from this learner-centered, from the teacher-centered classroom, where the teacher is doing most of the talking, to the complete personalized environment where the students even have a say of what they're going to learn like and what the sequence and what are the methods in which they're going to learn. There are all these other different stages that uh, teachers need to, to, to figure out and they need to consider. And frankly, we can't even assume that for all students, a complete autonomous environment is the ideal. Right. We provide a little chart that kind of indicated as you move towards learner centered instruction, you're slowly giving the students more autonomy and uh, more voice and choice. And so if we move to the next slide, uh, you will see um, a question. So uh, j this is just the way Houston did it. Right. But many districts are grappling with these conversations, you know, personalizing learning, differentiating learning, uh, learner-centered instruction. What are, what are the ways in which you have addressed this desire to move to a more like 21st century kind of learning environment? And so, Mitch, I guess I need your help now to divide people in groups. So this is the time to interact with each other. Uh, if you have a webcam and microphone, uh, click on the avatar of at least one more person and you'll join with them in a conversation and talk about, you know, how is this trend expressed in your school or your district and listen to how it's expressed in theirs and, and, and listen for some of the differences. If you don't have a webcam or mic microphone, uh, open up that IM window. Uh, again, hover over your avatar click on I am and a window will come up and start typing in some some comments about and comments from other people about how the trend has expressed itself in in your districts and schools. Um, I'm going to bring myself down to give you all a chance to do that. I see a couple of you are doing that right now. Um, I again I can't see the I am window but please if you don't have a webcam uh, the best way to learn is to participate so uh, so type in the I am window and uh, we'll come back up in a couple minutes.
Okay, so let me bring Beatrice back up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I separated you out. Um, uh, so you, you had a good chance to talk to people. I, I saw you talking first with uh, Steve Nordmark and Paula Malon. Um, you know, what, are, what were people thinking about this model of starting a teacher-centered and learner-driven and um, how we, you know, and, and moving towards a flexible configuration? What, what do you tend to hear and what did, what did you hear in the conversations? Well, in, in this conversation, nobody was a teacher. Oh. <laughs> And so Marco is um, a developer and he wanted to understand, you know, how, how does it look from the side of teachers and Paula, mm -hmm. of course, is an esteemed and, uh, and um, Steve, our esteemed colleagues, we have uh, collaborated in the past quite a bit um, mm -hmm. and I admire both of their work. Um, so we have had many conversations like this and I, what I continue to hear is that the challenge is not the technology, even though initially teachers tend to be intimidated by the technology. The challenge is uh, they actually learn the technology very quickly. The real challenge is what does it look like, you know, to give students more autonomy, uh, to give mm -hmm. them more power, and how does it look like to manage a classroom where everybody's not doing the same thing, mm -hmm. and how do you control that? Like if if there's a group of five people here working on a project and another group on the side working individually and at their own pace. And then there's a group of five meeting with a teacher. You know, that is the, the most difficult thing for teachers because, of course, they're all concerned about the end of course exams, right? Uh, we, we right. So is there, a, is there a model for, for, how, for how to do that? Well, I'll well, bet you that you have some slides on that, right? <laughs> so we, we have used uh, both SAMR from ISTE, and um, I'm sure most people who are present here are familiar with it. And, and also, mm -hmm. Houston has used um, the, the, the South, University of South Florida Technology Integration Matrix. Uh, mm -hmm. What it does is both SAMR and uh, TIM is that it provides a roadmap. For the teachers so when you are just adopting technology this is what your class might look like these are some of the actions you might be doing in a classroom where you're in the first stage and then adaptation might look like this and actually includes videos that demonstrate mm -hmm. what a math class uh, where the technology is used being used at the adaptation level might look like and with that instrument teachers are able to get together, share lesson plan, and help each other. Let's move this lesson from an adaptation to infusion. And they look at some videos, mm -hmm. and they, they, they have conversations, and, and then they help each other design and move the needle a little bit. And of course, moving mm -hmm. the needle progressively is very important, right? Because neither the mm -hmm. teachers nor the students are used to a more autonomous environment of teaching and learning, right? So, so I'm going to pull slide. that model up. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm going to pull that slide up. But in the meantime, I, I see some people are still connected, which is fine. But if you're here, if you're connected to somebody else and you're hearing an echo, you may want to separate from the group. If people separate from the groups, that tends to get rid of any echo because you may be hearing our voices come through people's speakers. So I'll pull myself down and I'll get your slide up so you can explain the model while people are watching. Okay, great. So in this slide, you see uh, a version of the technology integration matrix by the University of South Florida. All this is online. You can just Google uh, technology integration matrix and you will see it. And the original one, the one run by the University of South Florida, has actual videos that demonstrate the different stages. And so those, those videos are very useful for teachers. Um, <clears throat> what we've done with this model is we shared it with the teachers in their PLCs, and then the teachers help each other uh, modify their lessons. And then with the assistant principals and the principals, we also did a session, explain how the TIM works, that we added an additional row at the end of the matrix where it says, 
no technology used, but learner-centered instruction observed. Because our message is always, we use the technology when the technology is helpful, and when it's not, we'll put it aside. Um, so, so then we walk with the principals and the, and the assistant principals, and we observe several classrooms together, and we calibrate our tool together. Everybody walks with a blank sheet of paper. We divide it in half, and we write everything that we observe the teacher doing. What is the teacher doing? What are the students doing? And then the principals, assistant principals, and the ed tech leaders get together. And after observing the same classes, we share our impressions. And we discuss how easy it is to miss some things and how some people tend to see some things and some people tend to focus on others. This calibration process, we think, is really important to remember that all, all observation is relatively subjective, right? But in this way, not only are the teachers developing themselves and learning how to move slowly the needle towards transformative use of technology, towards a learner-centered centered environment, but also we are aligning the way that the principals and the assistant principals are observing the classes and providing feedback to the teachers. We can move on to the next slide unless people have questions. And so we share something like this with them, that, that we are progressively moving as we move toward transformative use of technology. We are moving also towards student ownership of learning, which means the students are more active. They're producing more objects. They uh, have choices about how they are going to learn. And the teacher is more and more a facilitator and a mentor on the side that helps and supports the production that the students are doing. So I want to pause here for a second just, just to give people an opportunity if, they, if somebody would like to provide some feedback or comments or make questions um, before we move on to uh, the Houston Digital Resources Strategy. Yeah, it'd be great if one of you could click on the raise hand, one of you with a microphone, and we can bring you up and kind of provide feedback and ask questions to Beatrice. And um, it's fun. So, um, you know, I know in your classes, you probably try to get the kids to this, uh, participate and the students to. Um, that's what we're trying to do here. <laughs> So uh, you can make that your, yeah. your worst audience is an audience full of teachers, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, so, um, so it just you know, while before before we go to Houston, you, you brought up that um, you know autonomy may not be the right uh, situation for every student. Maybe it may, may not be the ideal way to learn for every student at all times. Um, you know, maybe you could just talk about a couple of the exceptions here. You know, where isn't autonomy desirable? So first of all, we can't talk about learner-centered instruction if we don't give voice and choice to our teachers and our schools themselves, right? We can't say mm -hmm. we want to give voice and choice to the students and then overwhelm our teachers and principals and not give them voice, right? So it's mm -hmm. really important to allow each school to define what learner-centered instruction means for them, because they know their student population and their families better than anybody else. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what before we started, well, when we were in our first stages of our one-to-one -one implementation, we visited several school districts that were doing one-to-one -one implementations. And one of the most moving moments when I was walking between uh, classrooms in the school, uh, we walked into a classroom where there were about 10 students who had dropped out and they were back in school. Mm -hmm. in this particular group of students, the class was a lot more structured. Um, they had very clear directives from the teacher. Um, those students didn't have a lot of voice and choice. The teacher was guiding a lot of their learning. And I spoke with one of these young men about, you know, the, the teacher had told me he was ready to move into the mainstream. Uh, and I said, are you excited about leaving this classroom that is so structured and move on to the other side of the school where students have a lot more freedom? And he said, I'm not moving. This environment is perfect for me. Um, there's enough chaos in my house. When I come here, there is order. So for that student, 
a learner-centered instruction environment was to have the structure he never had when he mm -hmm. went home. And so there isn't, that's the, the thing, is there's no one size fits all. And just like it's true of, of schools, each one of our schools is designing and mm -hmm. articulating what 21st century learning looks like in their school. And, and so it has to it has to be a domino effect that goes all the way from central office to schools, from schools and school leaders to teachers and from teachers to students. It, the whole system has to be coherent. Mm -hmm. We're paying attention to people and we're listening to people and and we're letting them figure out how do they learn best. And it, it also seems to me that when, say, if, if a teacher is introducing technology or a school is introducing technology, that it just doesn't happen like that. You talked about the different stages. Um, you know, how typically is it something that takes a couple months or does it take a couple years? Oh, I would say at least a couple of years. Uh, and people need to be patient with themselves, right? Baby steps. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first year we implemented the one-to-one, -one, we said we were going to work with our early adopters. That was not exactly the best strategy because early adopters will adopt technology no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. Really, the theory is that you have to start with what people call the early majority. These are teachers that are not super reactive. These are teachers that are willing to try technology if you provide them with the supports that are necessary. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is when those teachers that are not your first tech adopters begin to use some of these tools and they begin to use them to maybe encourage the students and improve the engagement levels and make lessons that are more interactive, the other students look at that, the teachers look at that and say, well, if Mary can do that, then I think I can try, right? And so mm -hmm. the real transformation happens when your early majority adopts technology and what we call the early the late majority looks at that, and these are the people that are reluctant to use technology. They slowly move over. Mm -hmm. So I've just modeled how to ask you a question, right? And I thought it was great. So next time, uh, we'll move, I'll, I'll bring myself down and we'll do the slides, but next time, maybe one of the other participants will ask a question. I hope so. <laughs> So, um, as we were implementing our one-to-one, -one, of course, at this point, every single high school student in Houston ISD has a, a Windows device um, with an LMS that is a curriculum manager, has curriculum management, learning management, and um, a digital library in it. And all of their um, instructional materials are inside uh, the digital library. Uh, we're not going to talk about the technicalities of how we did that, but our goal was to put all the digital materials at the fingertips of the teachers and students and not have them have to log on to 150 different uh, platforms. So everything is in a single platform. Everything is single sign on. Um, so, but the first step was we'll just continue to purchase materials, right? So we procure. And we used IMS Global Open Interoperability Standards to into content. The first year was uh, content from 15 different vendors. And at this point, we have ingested content from about 35 different vendors. And so we have quite a number. We have quite a collection of digital objects in our library that is searchable by topics and standards. The second thing we said we would do was to curate content. And um, there's some people in the audience today that helped us do that. Um, you know, one of the things we did is uh, Innovation helped us by curating collections um, of materials from multiple sources to create uh, the focus of personalization is choice. So if we wanted to teach a topic, then we have to provide our students with choice. So everybody's not reading from the same single source or hearing from the unique teacher in the room. It, the point is that students need to have multiple sources. So curating content is really important. And so that means you have more than one, probably more than five different sources for every topic. And our third choice 
was to create content. And this is a combination effort by our curriculum department and some of our best teachers who are now developing content. And on the right hand side, you see the access issues and we use interoperability standards and uh, the creation of the content is actually inside our library. Our library has uh, editing tools to create our own content. We can move on to the next slide. So a lot of people tell us, how in the world did you manage this? And the truth of the matter is that the only possible way to do it is if everybody in central office is in sync and you're all collaborating. And I am not saying this to tell you that we are wonderful and that we all love each other every minute of the day and that we get along all the time. Uh, I, I, it, for two years, members of all these departments got together once a week for at least one hour. And all the decisions we made were made by members of all these different departments. And on top of this group, there was a steering committee that included at least chief, three chief officers from the district. And some of these uh, were arguments. And so what we had to figure out is who has the last word for which decisions. And sometimes you disagree with the decisions that are made, but you agree on, on who's on whose channel is it? And you have to stay on the area of your expertise. And when it's somebody else's turn to, to make a decision, you just go with it. So uh, this is what we call our power up flower. We can move on. Thank you. So this is a graphic that gives you step-by-step -step description of what our LMS looks like. So we have an LMS. The LMS has a library, but we're not talking about that yet. And on the left-hand side, you see LTI and single sign-on access um, from many different publishers, but all of it is access through one, just one single password. And they are all integrated via different single sign-on methods. So this is like a portal, if you, if you will say. And through this portal, teachers and students can access their digital publications as a unit. So if you're teaching biology one, this is, and if you want to want to see the whole scope and sequence in its entirety, including an index, this is where you go. So teachers that don't have so much experience, teachers that need a little help with curriculum, um, you go here and you see the book from beginning to end. Now, if we move to the other slide, we begin to see what else we were able to do through interoperability. And so you see there a box that says common cartridges and a common cartridge is a package that comes into your learning management system all together with content, activities, quizzes, everything, and is available to be opened by the students. This is a open standard. So once a publisher creates a common cartridge in essence, they should be able to upload the exact same cartridge in other LMSs. And so it shouldn't cost the district it should cost the district nominal fee because once they build the cartridge, they can plug and play in all the districts that, can, that buy the same cartridge. And, and then if we move to one more slide, you will see the third solution for content, which is the thin common cartridge. And really, the um, publishers like this solution a lot better. They don't like when you ingest their content in your library because now you can change it, and they don't like that. So in Think Common Cartridge, you have all the functionalities of the common cartridge. The content opens in your LMS as if it was living in your LMS, but in fact, the content is in the servers of the publishers. But here we have in Houston, content from at least 35 different publishers. We have more than, we have close to 2 million learning objects from multiple sources, and they open inside our digital library, inside the LMS without additional passwords. You simply go to the library, type a keyword, click on a standard, and the library shows you a list of possible objects your students can use for learning. And so some will be visual, some are going to be organizers, some are gonna be videos, some will be texts. Uh, some of them will be assessments or assignments and from many different publishers. And a teacher can provide the students with options. So we can move on to the next slide. Here is a, a snapshot of our portal. Uh, we're working with Clever. We found 
halfway through the process that Clever was already providing single sign-on to a bunch of our publishers. So this is just the single sign-on solution that was on the left of the graphic, where teachers can access a platform intact that is external to the LMS, but it opens as if it was in the LMS. Nobody really knows, and you can see the complete content. So with that, we solve the pain point of having to do 250 different logins and passwords and teachers having to populate the student name and adding them to platforms, etc. And what you see here is a snapshot of a search I did in the library, and I picked up three different objects from different vendors. Uh, I think you can see here. I don't see the name. Usually you see the name of the of the, oh, here it was created by a teacher. The second one was created by a teacher also. And the third one is a publication created by HMH. And so the idea is that now, very soon, we will be able to add materials that are in Spanish or English and also at different le levels of reading. Like if a student is reading at sixth grade level and the content is eighth grade level, potentially you could find a simpler reading for them. There's a question. So the question is, how difficult was it to create a seamless system with a publisher's content? Well, the good news is that there's many LMSs in K-12 today that have adopted IMS Global Interoperability Standards. At the very minimum, you're able to create a single sign-on access via LTI in your LMS. And, you know, I, to name a few, um, you have Blackboard, It's Learning, Desire to Learn, Canvas, Google uh, They all offer at least LTI. Um, our LMS is It's Learning. They offer us common cartridge, thing to one cartridge. So you actually can import the content. When you see this snapshot here, you can import the content in small chunks. So the book breaks down like the like it breaks down in the index page. You can search for a topic and find that page, and you have a discrete segment with information you're looking for. The LMS was not a problem. Um, the publishers initially were a little reluctant to adopt this. They said, well, only, I know it's an open standard, but only Houston is asking for this. It's too costly. And most cases, all we had to do is give them the use case, explain to them, look, teachers can't really manage the classroom like this, you know. We need to create a coherent ecosystem so that teachers and schools and principals are focusing on teaching and learning and, and they don't have to work additional hours to populate 250 different platforms. So most publishers were very responsive to the case, to the use case uh, issue. And we all learned together. We all made a lot of mistakes. There were cartridges that were not built properly, and we had to test them five different times. But here we are. And if we could do it, now other people can do it too. And other districts are, in fact, doing it. And uh, I think there's another. OK, Paula has a question. Paula has Come a over. Hi, Beatrice. Um, I know, obviously, you know, the IMS uh, global standards are important and that was a key driver on your LMS, but how, but as you said, there's a number of LMSs that um, would meet that requirement. I'm curious um, how with that, you know, your flower of power of decision makers, uh, how did you decide on the LMS? Like what was that process like and, and how long did it take um, to determine, the, you know, because it is a dis big decision. Oh, yeah, it's a big decision. It took us probably about 10 months from beginning to end. Uh, we took about two months, three months to do research before we wrote the RFP. And when we did write the RFP, we wrote an RFI, Request for Information. Um, and we made it closed because if you do it open, then nobody answers, right? Which means you do a closed RFI, only the people that respond to your request for information are eligible to apply to the RFP. Um, we knew that LMSs were changing very rapidly. This is three years ago. And so after doing a little research, we wrote the RFI. We read all the RFIs. We asked for sunboxes. 
And um, after that, we rewrote the RFP, we changed some things, and um, we came uh, in the end with, uh, and, and, and IT did not write the RFP or the RFI. We facilitated the writing and we wrote the part that IT should write, but our curriculum department and our professional development departments wrote all the items that refer to teaching and learning, curriculum management, digital content, um, learning management, you know, everything that had to do with teaching and learning was developed by our curriculum people. And while we were doing the research, we learned about open interoperability standards. And we wrote a little paper for the non-technical professionals. What does interoperability mean? Why is this important to you? And after that, they were the champions for interoperability. I mean, they used to joke, they used to say, once we learn how to spell interoperability, we were just fine. And um, so it was, we all grew together and we all discovered together. So was there general, at the end of the day, was there general consensus or did somebody, was the final decision maker have to make a call? And if so, was it the IT group or your curriculum group that ultimately? Oh, we had a huge, um, a huge RFP committee that included more curriculum people than anything else. Uh, some professional development people, it included principals and teachers, not many because they have to be in the schools. And it included IT, and IT just, IT said these are not acceptable because we couldn't integrate them, we couldn't work with them, you know. So we selected the ones that were not negotiable. But then the decision was made, really, by curriculum professional development. And here's the thing, the teachers were leaning towards an LMS that was simpler, that, was, that had a very simple interface but it didn't have all the personalized learning features. So we had lots of arguments and discussions and we, we gave sandboxes to people and we demonstrated things. And in the end, what we did is the decision, we, we told everybody, this is the strategy of the district where our goal is to personalize learning. And we mapped all the features to the goal. And then the 40 something people in the committee voted. So it was on the was bottom. Was it a simple majority or did you have to have? <laughs> no, it was very close. It was very close, but I think we made the right choice. Um, we, I mean, the library we have today and the ability to align standards to content and standards to assessment questions is pretty impressive. You can build a quiz and align each question to specific standards. You can build a whole quiz just about one standard, you know, and you can say, Students need to master it at least at 80%, 80% before we move on or before that student moves on. Mm -hmm. So the, these are things we couldn't even imagine three years ago, right? We, we mm -hmm. could dream them, but <laughs> not really think we could make them yet. So here's a big shot of the recommendations engine. You build a quiz and you align each question to standards and then you get a report that says, here's the students that master these standards and here's the students that didn't master the standards. And then the engine makes a list recommending content they can use for relearning or reteaching. But the teacher and the student can override the list and create a customized list as well. So this is a very sophisticated product. Okay, so <clears throat> there were many other problems we had to solve and we're still solving. For example, our teachers went really app happy. As you probably know, there's lots of really fantastic apps out there that you can use, particularly to encourage students to be more active learners and to encourage participation and student production, etc. Well, you run into problems with student data privacy, safety, and security when you use open applications. Um, how do we decide to select and procure the content? How are we managing that? All those discussions happened. We created new processes. We created new regulations, modified everything. Uh, we didn't, I should say, we didn't hire anybody new. All the roles are, we modified people's jobs. We uh, uh, repurposed um, budgets. Uh, 
uh, nothing was added, right? Um, we had to manage and have extensive conversations with publishers, and sometimes we had big fights, but most, in, in all cases, we're still friends. And, um, and, I, and, and I think the biggest challenge of all is the scaling of teacher innovation. That, you know, we're not done, it's gonna take a long time, and I think every district that has implemented a one-to-one -one would tell you the same thing. But we're open to talk about any of these topics. I think we have a few images in the next few slides to prompt the conversation. So you have a link here. If you go to this link, you will see a free, um, it's a site where you can hover over different open apps in the web. And when you hover, you see a little report card that gives you a rating for privacy, safety, and security. We did this to help our teachers. They don't have time to read licenses. And the card just says, if you use this app in class, this is how to use it so you don't break the law. So you can you know, follow SIPA, COPA, et cetera. Uh, that's open to the public. <clears throat> you can move to the next slide. Here is a snapshot of that site. Uh, on the right, you see the website. On the left, you see an example of a card. It's very simple, very easy to read. Teachers and students and parents can look at it and say, OK, this is how we're going to use it. Is it PG-13? Is it you know, parental consent required? Uh, do you create student accounts? Do you not? Do you create a generic account, et cetera? We can move on. Um, I think the most important thing that we're doing this year is you can restrict, you can filter, you can block content, you can provide tools for teachers to tell them how to use apps safely. But in the end, our students walk in the classroom with their cell phones and their tablets, and they live with their cell phones. And so if we're not teaching them how to be responsible users of, users of technology, how to manage their online identity, how to protect their data, and how to protect themselves, then we're not doing a very good job as educators. This is the world in which they live. So we have developed a campaign in co collaboration with the Future of Privacy Forum, and we give students scripts about all the basic topics about in online safety, like bullying, phishing, how to create safe accounts, how not to talk to strangers online, and all that stuff. And the students themselves, they make these videos about privacy and safety online. And we've developed um, very interactive uh, training for our teachers. Our teachers can all recite FERPA, but then they don't know what FERPA really means when you're using free apps online. So uh, these course gives them very clear examples of how sometimes you may be violating FERPA without knowing. Uh, what are the rules for intellectual property? It used to be that you could just use material as long as it was for education. That's no longer the truth, and we can get sued, and uh, teachers really need to observe the rules. So a lot of training and user uh, awareness, and, and now there's an even more urgent reason. Uh, you probably all have heard about ransomware, and uh, the way ransomware works work more or less. I know there's some better technologies than me in the audience. Um, is that you basically volunteer your password. And if they get enough people passwords, essentially the hackers then capture data from your district. And then they, they lock it up so that you can't see it. And then they charge you money so that you have to pay money to free the data that you need back for your students and users. And so they do this through phishing, right? A lot of us have received uh, phishing emails. They used to be really clumsy. They're no longer clumsy, they're very convincing. So we're teaching our teachers and staff what these new phishing uh, emails look like and what to look for, how to right click and see the real email address behind the fake email address and things like that. We're ready for the next slide. So I don't know if you can show, there's a very short video here um, that Mitch, you have, if you can put that up.
This is Amelia and Catherine from Houston Independent School District here to talk to you about phishing. Phishing is the attempt to acquire sensitive information such as usernames, passwords, and credit card details, and sometimes indirectly money, often for malicious reasons, by masquerading as a trustworthy entity in electronic communication. I got this email from Instagram. It says, Dear user, you have not recently been on Instagram. Please click here and log into your account. If you don't log in, in the next three days, we will shut down your account. After those three days, you can pay your new year account. Sincerely, the Instagram team. That looks fishy to me. It was all misspelled, so it's probably a phishing scam. Huh? <laughs> Get it? Fishy? Fishing? So. Okay, no, okay. I can tell because the message contains poor spelling and grammar like for days. The message asks for personal information. Or asks to send money to cover expenses, and the message makes unrealistic threats. Oh, I've heard of phishing before. I know that the most common phishing scams are too good to be true offers on social media, phony job ads, fake warnings from banks, charity scams, and fake e-cards. Yep. So don't click that link, Amelia, because once you do, a virus will upload to your computer. Thanks, Catherine, for all your help. This is Amelia and Catherine from Houston ISD reminding you to think before you click. All right, welcome back. <clears throat> So here's a, a chart uh, that describes uh, in a very simple way how we modified our uh, textbook adoption process. We, we went from adopting textbooks to adopting instructional materials. Some of them are still text in the elementary level where we don't have a one-to-one -one environment. And some of them, and, and the high school level, it's all digital. Uh, we embedded a tech specialist in the process. We educated the curriculum department. They are the biggest advocates of our strategy. And so we looked at the content and we provide feedback and input about what content we think will integrate better in our LMS. And with very few exceptions, all our content is now ingested as a thin common cartridge and we are able to find it in small discrete chunks of content that is discoverable by keywords and standards. There's a few exceptions uh, with some very esoteric courses that there's very few publications and in those cases we didn't have a choice. Uh, so it goes from the, the schools that make recommendations to central office and we make some final decisions and so you can see how we modified our process. Uh, <clears throat> So if you're interested in any of these topics, we typically get online or get on the phone with other districts and we share with people our documentation, our processes. We even had a script initially about how to talk to vendors because there were too many for just me talking to them. So I had trained my whole team. Each person had five or six vendors they managed. How do you welcome them to the district and help them get excited about this process because it's gonna be a lot of work. And so they have to be as excited as we were uh, about bringing their content into the platform. Um, they also developed different materials depending on who we were talking to, the superintendent, the cabinet, the teachers, the principals, uh, so that they understand what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and also, uh, we've also um, adopted a thing called One Roster, which is uh, also an interoperability standard by IMS. Um, probably many of you do rostering to provide access to your digital materials and, and you probably know that this can take enormous amounts of time and resources. By adopting one roster, we only use a single format and all our rostering is done by the first day of class, which never happened before. So we're ready for the last slide, I think. And so, I was thinking, you know, sometimes people will say, yeah, well, I know what you're thinking. You're Houston. You have all these people to do this work for you. You have more money. You have this. We, we don't really have more money. We are a larger district. And of course, when you're a larger district, you have more resources. But 
we are very happy to help smaller districts that maybe don't have the resources and we give them everything we have developed because our goal is that this becomes a standard for K-12 education, that we resolve the problem of having to have teachers create accounts for their students and waste their time doing this instead of focusing on teaching and learning. So we should open the floor. Okay, so um, please uh, enter your questions um, or raise your hand if, you, if you'd like to come up on stage. Um, in the meantime, I guess one question that I have, you'd mentioned that um, you, know, you have this resource that teachers can use to evaluate, um, to evaluate a program and then you, you share those. You, you, is there a link for that in the slides? Uh, we, I think there was. Uh, yeah, the web apps. So it's HoustonISD.org mm -hmm. forward slash web apps, mm -hmm. W-E-B-A-P-P-S. Uh, teachers do not evaluate the apps. We don't make teachers oh, work okay. more. They have enough work. Uh, we evaluate the apps. I have uh -huh, a health okay. team. We mm -hmm. read the license agreements. We created a rubric that evaluates mm -hmm. the apps and the license agreement language for data privacy, safety, and security. But we also run the the URL, the domain through, um, um, what do you call that, secure server, SSL mm -hmm. server. There is a tool online that, uh, and so we run a, a report and some, some of them, that's for checking if there is encryption while in transit. So even mm -hmm. if they're not sharing your student data, is it being, is it, can it be seen by hackers in transit? Mm -hmm. And um, we give them a grade in addition to the stars. And you know what? We have had more than 15 apps, mm -hmm. free apps, owners, CEOs call us and say, you gave me one star for this and one star for that. And we tell them why. And they have changed wow. their practices. They are rewriting mm -hmm. their license agreements and they are changing their encryption services. It's been a learning process for them as well. And so this is fantastic, you know, because People that are developing apps don't necessarily know what are the rules for education, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. And they also, so what do you, they also no. go to the Future of Privacy Forum. They have a boot camp for developers, and they show, they show developers what are the rules for K-12, mm -hmm. right? And what are you speaking on at FETC? Uh, <laughs> we're doing a workshop uh, mm -hmm. on Friday morning uh, about... Uh, the interoperability process. How do you ingest your cartridges? How do you test them? How do you manage the whole process? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure some people are intimidated by it, but actually it's not that complicated. I think and, it's a lot more work mm -hmm. for the publishers, but, uh, and we're doing that. And then I'm talking about the return on instruction. So we have some numbers today, three years later. Mm -hmm. And there are some areas in which our students have improved, not all of mm -hmm. the areas yet. You know, results and scores are a complicated thing. There isn't one single uh, factor that will improve teaching and learning. There's many factors, as probably everybody in the audience knows. Right, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. you know, it takes good, good school leadership, good teacher supports. You know, we all should be evaluated, not just the teachers, right? Mm -hmm. How good am I at supporting teachers? you know, and from central office and so forth. So but there are some results. There are some preliminary results. So for sure, from the first year on, uh, our student engagement and uh, student behavior improved. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew that we wouldn't have score improvement at least until the third year, but we had some score improvement on year two. And so oh. we're going to talk a little bit about that and so what are some of the what lessons learned. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'd like to encourage everybody uh, to uh, to go to FETC and 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 come to your conferences and come to come to your sessions and um, you'll, you'll be able to you all have handouts at those sessions also. Um, and I will say, question. oh, there is oh you see it yeah. there's okay. Yeah, what's I don't Maggie, see that question. Mm -hmm. Maggie says, um, can can we give you information? Will we get the copy of the presentation and who to contact for information about these tools to evaluate the apps? 
our small K6 district is currently working on this. Thanks, Maggie. Maggie, of course, the, uh, the slides are going to be available. Yeah, we'll um, have them on our website. Is there a way to put my email in the chat for everybody? Um, you, you could probably type it in or, oh, you know something? It wasn't in one of the slides. So maybe you could resend me the slides where uh, and, and put your email address in. Okay, and I'm yeah. also sending my email address to Maggie. In the IM? Yeah. Uh, so it's larnia at houstonisd.org. L for Juliana, and then my last name without the S at houstonisd.org. We, we will be very happy to send you everything we have. And uh, also I should say that Common Sense Media has also developed an online instrument um, right. where they evaluate apps. And we're mm -hmm. also helping them evaluate apps. They have a much more sophisticated rubric that automatically selects the the text in the contract where you should read. <laughs> so yes. it you save a lot of time. And um, I think that's privacy.commonsense.org. Um, right. So yeah, they they've already evaluated the, uh, about a hundred apps. And so between those and our apps, uh, you have quite a collection. Right. Well, thank you. These are uh, these were great tools, and it was fascinating listening to you. And uh, I'll, I'll I'll see you in Florida and see you online. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us this evening. I know you all were so. Really thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> all right. Take care. <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay. And this is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. Hope to see you in a couple weeks, and hope everybody has a very very uh, happy Thanksgiving. Good night.